The Access to Capital Educational Series, The Fundamentals of Startup Financing, is made possible by the generous financial support of the Truist Foundation. Access to Capital is an educational program of Verge and its affiliates. RAMP, the Regional Accelerator, Roanoke Blacksburg Technology Council, and its partners, The Launch Place, the Appalachian Council for Innovation, and Blue Ridge PBS. Our first topic, or lesson, focuses on federal grant sources, such as the SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Program, and the STTR, Small Business Technology Transfer Program, often referred to as America's Seed Fund. We are delighted to have Robert Brook, Director of Federal Funding Programs at the Virginia Innovation Partnership Corporation, as one of our guests today. Robert is a great resource for any Virginia-based company that wants to explore federal grant possibilities. Robert, thanks for joining us today, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you for the invitation, Craig. It's my pleasure. Maybe let's start off. Just tell us a little bit about uh, VIPSI uh, and your role there, if you would, please. Yeah, well, the Virginia Innovation Partnership Corporation, or now VIPSI, or VIPC, is, is a state-funded nonprofit here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So we get primarily all of our funding from the Commonwealth. And, and, and our mission and really our overview is to um, accelerate early commercialization and funding support for Virginia innovations and entrepreneurs and startups and market development initiatives across the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. We concentrate a lot on the um, early commercialization and seed funding stages of innovation, helping innovators and tech entrepreneurs launch and grow new companies, create high paying jobs and accelerate economic growth, again, throughout the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. Yeah, thank you. How about uh, exploring with our audience a little bit about the SBIR and STTR programs that you work so closely with, Robert? Sure, and, and so yeah, my role here at uh, VIPC is to focus primarily on the SBIR and STTR support initiatives. Uh, and VIPC also has an investment fund that we make actual dilutive investments into high growth potential companies. And we have multiple funds within that ranging anywhere from up to $50,000 to up to $100,000, depending on the fund. There's a fund that focuses on women-owned companies and minority-owned. There's one that focuses on companies uh, across the Commonwealth and more underserved regions. And then there's our regular, what we call our tech fund of sorts, or the Virginia Venture Partners Fund, which is you know, funding uh, up to 100K investments into high-growth potential companies across Virginia. And we have a also a, um, a grant-based fund, so sort of the, the other side of the coin for grants. So it's non-dilutive, and that's an annual solicitation now that's come out, and it, it provides up to $75,000 grants into companies and, and to help support various efforts towards commercializing their technology. So we're talking here on all these programs about advancing and investing in technology-based companies. So there's gotta be some sort of core technology to be, uh, to be engaging with CIT and, and, and VIPC, excuse me. Um, and, and then the SBIR support program, which I provide support on, is not using necessarily Commonwealth of Virginia dollars, but it's helping to promote the federal research dollars that are available through the Small Business Innovation Research and the Small Business Technology Transfer Program. And I'm providing a lot of training, mentoring, uh, some small grants to help companies apply for these things. Because um, they are the most, some of the most important uh, sources of early stage seed capital. It's about almost 25% of all seed funding in, the, in the America is through the SBIR and STTR programs. Um, the charter of the SBIR program, as it was developed by the National Science Foundation over 40 years ago now, was to stimulate technological innovation, uh, use small businesses to meet the federal research and research development needs, and foster and encourage participation by socially and economically disadvantaged small businesses and those that are 51% owned and controlled by women. And uh, also increase private sector commercialization of innovations derived from federal research and research and development, and thereby increasing the competition, productivity, and economic growth, and really you know, providing a, a, a place for early stage scientists and technologists to go to get that first seed capital. 
Wow, 25% is a big, big number. How much money are we talking about, Robert, uh, might be available through these types of grants? Well, it's actually a lot. It's a, you know, it's actually a derivation of the overall, what they call extramural R&D budget at the federal agency. So, uh, the, you know, in a lot of ways we talk about SBIR and SCTR being the same. I'll just kind of, I'll usually say SBIR, but it encompasses all. Um, the SBIR program itself is the 3.2% set aside of the, of the money, the budget that the, each agency spends outside of their uh, agency, so on outside uh, investments. And uh, so SBIR is 3.2% and STTR is just a 0.45%, so much smaller. Uh, we'll talk about the basic differences in SBIR and STTR here in a moment, but for the, the core initiative there is that the, the STTR program requires the small business to collaborate with a nonprofit research institution or university, Virginia Tech, and University of Virginia. So they have to be a sort of a, a, an official subcontractor to the company. The SBIR does not require that. So, but there's a lot smaller amount of money in STTR than SBIR. And there's other differences we probably won't have time to go over today, but, um, but there's almost, almost $4 billion now annually spent, uh, invested in, you know, in these, or what we call really seed funding, early seed, seed funding to America's small businesses through this. That's a tremendous amount of money. What, what are some of the federal agencies that are involved with the uh, SBIR and STTR program, Robert? Well, first, I mean, I mean, before I get to that, I'll just make a mention that the program is kind of a geared to fund early stage, high risk, high payoff innovation for companies that are maybe approaching banks, approaching investors, and they hear the come back when. You come back when you've got outside investors, come back when you've got customers. So that's the key premise of the program. So the agencies that participate, again, by law, if you've got over a billion dollars a year in uh, annual expenditures as an agency outside of, of research, outside the agency, you by law have to participate in the SBIR and STTR program. For those, uh, uh, excuse me, the SBIR and STTR program, for those that, that uh, are over $100 million, just have to do um, the SBIR program. So there are tw uh, 11 agencies, and these run the gamut from the Department of Defense, which is almost half the program in and of itself, um, Health and Human Service, which includes the CDC and the NIA National Institutes of Health, Department of Energy, Na NASA, National Science Foundation, and those are the, the five bigger ones that participate in both SBIR and STTR. And the agencies with smaller programs and only participate in the SBIR program are USDA, you know, Agriculture, uh, Homeland Security, Department of Commerce, which includes uh, NIST and NOAA, Department of Transportation, Department of Education, and uh, last but not least, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. So those are the 11 key agencies that participate. And you know, for the most part, uh, you know, those are the agencies that because I often get companies that are trying to say, I want to talk to uh, the CIA or FBI or um, Department of Interior, and, and they don't have those research budgets or they, they're exempt for some reason or the other. So, but, but it's important for our audience, I guess, to understand what the agency source points are because it mat might match up with the innovation they're working on and be the best uh, match for them to pursue a, a potential grant. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's correct. And, and also understanding the mission. Each of these agencies participate in these programs. Um, you know, as, as over 40 years, and, and the program's grown and the agencies, as the money has become larger, the agencies, you know, they pretty much need to use the money as is appropriate for their agency. And, and so they, you know, look at their mission and each agency's mission is very different who they serve, how they use the program. You know, we talk about it being sort of the, some agencies that want to be the event, eventual buyer of the technology, like Department of Defense or NASA. They have missions, they've got astronauts, they've got soldiers, um, and they've got, you know, specific needs. And, and then you know, we call those user agencies. And then there's the, the non-user agencies that don't, are not going to be the customer themselves. Uh, they're looking more, solving, you know, America's problems, the National Science Foundation, for example, or the National Institutes of Health, 
they've got specific missions that are really more, you know, commercially focused based. So they're, so uh, there's a very big difference in how a company would approach and think about and plan and even the actual writing of each of these grants um, is a little bit different. And that's why we do what we do to help guide companies through that. Can you uh, talk to our audience a little bit about the eligibility requirements, uh, general eligibility requirements, and also uh, what the application process looks like uh, for someone that's considering this opportunity? Certainly, yeah. So, so the, the program is US funded um, taxpayer dollars. So um, to be eligible, it's a small business set aside program and that's the only allocation or requirement a company has to have as far as um, you know, participation is a, be a small business that's less than 500 employees, uh, must be for profit. So you cannot be an organized 501c3, you can't be a non-for-profit, you have to be a for profit because the agencies really want you to, the government built this program for you to be, you know, a little bit, a little bit of greed, talk about, you know, the, the big market, the problem, how you're going to make money, commercialize this, which is a little bit different um, than, than a lot of other programs that are out there or funding, for example, the micro universities. But you want to be a for-profit, um, U.S. owned and operated, so you cannot be controlled by a foreign entity. Uh, all work must be done in the United States. If you've got offices overseas, that's fine, but you cannot outsource money to be performed overseas. You can't, and even in your own offices overseas, it has to be spent in the U.S. Um, if you're collaborating with another company, purchasing equipment or some sort of resource for the project, it must be done through U.S. distributors. So all the money is spent with U.S. entities. And the focus of the program is performing uh, R&D. And there are, there are, there are um, rules and different uh, special uh, requirements for the primary investigator, uh, which is the person that would be in charge of the project scientifically and technically. Uh, there are, you know, they must be uh, you know, employed by the company full time, at least fifty one percent. They have to be obviously in the U.S. and uh, <clears throat> that requirement does vary a little bit depending on SBI or STTR, as we mentioned. But there, you know, we'll probably. Uh, reserve that for a later talk um, or, or discussion through some other training we have. But the goal of this is really commercialization for small you know, commercialization support, helping companies build new technology that's going to be hopefully benefiting either the agency directly or America as a whole. And, and what does that application process look like from sort of A to Z uh, generally, Robert? Sure. Well, with the 11 agencies, um, you know, they all kind of have different uh, time frames, uh, depending on if they're going to be buying it, you know, and if we're going to be selling it. You know, certainly t certain types of technologies will take longer to, to develop. Sometimes when you're dealing in the world of medicine and, and, and drugs, these can take, you know, many, many, many years, a decade or so to finally commercialize. But the processes, there's some core processes that are similar. You've got to be able to apply with an open solicitation or what some agencies call a broad agency announcement. Um, you're gonna be spending you know, a good couple, between two and three or four months, depending on the agency, uh, writing that proposal, not getting paid by the agency to do so. So it's sort of your overhead, right? Uh, they are, you, you, you um, submit that to the agency through their portal. Everything's online, you know, they're not mailing in any proposals anymore. So it's got to be online. So you have to be, a, you know, be able to have that ability to, to engage with these agencies online. There's a lot of registrations that have to be completed um, with the federal government and, and you know, getting an actual company formed. They have to be applying as a company. Um, and then you submit and sometimes wait, you know, they're going to be waiting between three, four, six months, perhaps, uh, to get word back from the agency on whether or not you've been awarded that first phase. And the program is built in several phases. Um, some say two, some say three. The first phase is a phase one, which is a feasibility study. So you're looking to you know, validate in, in a relatively short amount of time uh, you know, your, your, your phase one idea, your concept. And then the, you know, if, if that's proved feasible, you can get to the second phase, which is uh, more prototype development, additional scaling, further testing. And the goal is phase three. And the phase three uh, essentially is um, 
not SBIR money. It could be other federal money, but it's not that set aside. We talked about that percentage set aside. So the phase three money uh, could be you selling product. It could be you getting additional research investment from that agency out of outside other buckets of money. So the goal there, you know, it's really supposed to be an economic development program. You know, they want you to be greedy <laughs> at some level, mm -hmm. sell product, uh, hire employees, pay taxes on your product and your employees. And that money comes back again in a big loop. Um, these opportunities are coming around at different, different paces, right? So the larger agencies, we mentioned those top five agencies uh, that have the largest amount of budget. They're going to be usually having anywhere between two and four solicitations or announcements per year. So uh, that's part of our goal. Our role is to help companies learn that process, where to find the opportunities, how to time things uh, in advance to start doing your homework. Like any, and like any you know, effort to secure outside money, you don't just think about it one day and try to do it the next day. It's going to be a, multi, sure. you know, a, a really planned process. Um, so that's kind of the overall view of the program. And, and you know, phase one's typically six months to a year, sometimes depending on the agency, um, anywhere between $50,000 to a couple hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars in that phase one. Again, it's agency dependent. There's some special programs that some of the agencies have built that have that smaller amount for sort of a more invested, quicker investigation. Applying for phase two, then you're successful in phase one, you have to validate it was successful. Feasibility has been proved. Let's move on to apply for the second phase. Assuming you get the second phase, which not everybody gets, uh, that could be anywhere between half a million dollars to uh, 1.5 million with additional follow-on money as well. And what this program is really doing is it's it, all, the whole continuum of funding is de-risking, right? I think a lot of the programs you're going to be talking about in, in, in this series is uh, about, you know, de-risking. And, and you want to be able to get to the next level of funding or customers, and that's through de-risking. So phase one is the highest risk. Uh, phase two is a little bit less risky and, of course, trying to sell things. Hopefully, it's, you know, most of the risk has been mitigated and you're trying to sell things. And that's really the, the sort of the process there of your average SBR and STTR. Now, there are differences in agencies and their times and, you, um, and you know, how they're going to be buying it or, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that can happen in federal funding, of course. Um, the markets can change. You need to, you know, the proverbial pivot, they call it these days. But um, that's a general time frame. So if you're looking to develop a, a quick little app and to get funding within a couple of months and start selling it, that might be a great investment opportunity or providing you some of that really early stage data that provides you with more understanding of the customers that you're engaging with. And, but it, 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 that app in and of itself, most likely, if it's just a couple month project, then you're going to start trying to sell it. It's not going to be an SBIR. You're looking at larger time frame, larger technical hurdles that need to be overcome for these programs. And, and, and that gets to the innovation level, which I think is different. You know, what the agencies are requiring from innovation is a little different uh, in some cases from the agencies like DOD that wants to buy the technology compared to the agency that, you know, they're not going to be the buyers, so they can make you shoot for the moon, so to speak. You know, the NIH and the NSFs of the world, they really want you to be a revolutionary concepts that have a big, big technical hurdle because they that's their luxury. They're not going to be the buyer. Whereas the DODs and NASAs, they have particular missions, so they can be a little bit less risky. Uh, and then they, they want to get something that's better than what they have now. So that's sort of the general process and sort of the context of the program. So, so Robert, uh, what's the success rate for people applying for these types of grants? What's sort of the batting average of applicants? And are there some real live examples from the regions where uh, we live and work every day of, of companies that have been successful in getting these types of grants? Yeah, I mean, there's a, you know, I guess the quick answer is, you know, the agency's success rates do vary. Some of the smaller agencies get a lot more applications and the rates can be a little low. Um, we're looking at generally phase one is about between 10 and 20 percent success rate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think assuming that you're doing the proper planning, you know, your homework, engaging with someone like myself uh, um, to help and get, 
understand the process better, go through some training courses that we have available. We'll talk about that, I think, in a few minutes here. Um, the phase two is about, you know, it's a sort of a down select, of, they say, getting from phase one, you have to get phase one to get to phase two. For the most part, there are some direct to phase two opportunities that some of the eight larger agencies do have. Uh, but, um, but it's about a 40% hit rate follow on from phase one to get to phase two. But if you're looking at comparing that to other venture capital funding sources, for example, um, those are taking six to 12 months and, and it's about a 1% probability of getting uh, investment. Most companies really aren't venturable from a true venture sense. And it's a little bit different in the SBIR world. And are there some examples of companies around here that you can, can point yeah. to? Well, in, in the Roanoke region, um, in Roanoke, Blacksburg, um, in that whole, in, there's several, um, Nanosonic comes to mind, Luna Innovations. Um, those, they've won between the two of them, I, over you know, hundred, hundreds or so of, of these, of these um, grants and contracts from multiple agencies. And they're growing and building and paying taxes and solving problems that the agencies have. From a larger perspective, you know, uh, historically, I mean, Symantec and Qualcomm, if you're looking historical, they, some of their earliest technology development uh, were funded by the SBR program. Sonicare, the, I used that toothbrush this morning myself. Um, 23andMe, uh, you're hearing a lot about them, you know, what they do. Uh, those are all founded. The core foundational technologies were vetted and developed through the SBR programs. Robert, we're coming uh, close to our time, but a uh, couple of final things. Any uh, general wrap-up comments that you might uh, want to make and also share with our audience uh, to learn more about these programs and uh, how to contact you, uh, what resources are out there, if you could address that, please. Certainly, you know, the, 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 the top list of things that I, I always, you know, I, I'm an advocate for SBAR. It's what I do here. Um, it's not for everybody, not, you know, there's all sorts of funding and, and that's the, the key to a company to understand really what's the best fit for them right now. Um, so if it is SBIR, we can talk about the benefits of that and that there's, there's no equity loss, you know, there it's versus a venture capital where you're, um, it sounds glamorous and fun and everybody's promoting getting venture capital spinning out of the accelerators and incubators and going after venture capital immediately but it's usually not the best the fit, depending on, again, where you are, what the market's saying. And it's not a loan. It's basically, it's a grant. You do not owe it back and you don't lose equity. Um, you maintain all the intellectual property. So you are not losing any opportunity uh, to, to develop intellectual property uh, versus, versus a work for others, which if you're a federal government, you know, if you get a contract with the government, to do a help desk support, great. And when that contract ends, it, it, you developed nothing. There was no tools. You don't take anything with you. It was a work for hire situation. So you do main, develop and maintain the intellectual property and the data rights that you secure if it's a grant. Uh, it gets great credibility. I mean, a lot of people, particularly investors um, who are looking at you know investing in you, they like to see that you've been vetted credibly through uh, other sources perhaps. And, and particularly if it's more commercially focused where you're looking at getting a venture capital model if you've been medical devices, uh, smart community, unmanned systems, cybersecurity, all these you know, IT stuff that you might be doing. You know, if you've got more con concepts, you know, getting validation through the SBAR program and get that key early stage risk mitigated through this program is, is very important, especially in the scheme of the the venture capital down the road. And the last but not least, it, you know, and we'll, we talk about this extensively in more the deeper training classes that we provide, provides, uh, if you win an SBIR or SDTR, it provides you with a, a contracting vehicle that if you're looking to sell to other agencies, you can use that as a contracting vehicle to get sole source follow-on sort of no bid um, contracts, you know, based on your ability to obviously engage with agencies and do the business development activities that would require but that's a great perk, especially if you're going to be in this long term and really developing key tools to uh, to solve the problems. It's a it's a very important uh, piece of the puzzle. 
And, and maybe just wrap up, Robert, where would you point our audience to find out more about this? Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge and expertise residing in your head, but uh, where should our audience turn to learn more? Right. So, you know, I give uh, about a dozen training classes annually. Um, currently, they're mostly virtual. So, which the, the bright side is we're able to record those. So right now we have over 30 some recorded webinar trainings um, of various sorts, intros to customer testimonials, to investor tips, to you know, uh, Department of Defense, NASA, Department of Energy, uh, National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, Department of Defense, uh, between an hour long, five hour long training sessions, all available for free for Virginia based companies. Um, there are small fees for non-Virginia-based companies if they choose to uh, look at that training. And uh, so it's on our website. You go to our, we have a, a lot of sort of a, a live active events calendar that you can find the current upcoming sessions on. Uh, you go to our virginiaipc.org and find the events page. If you want to look at the recordings, you go to our uh, initiatives under the SBIR program initiatives at that website, virginiaipc.org and uh, look at the SBIR initiatives, and there's a archived webinar section. That's all you can uh, sort through there. And of course, by all means, you know, I'm happy to talk to companies, send me an email. Uh, my email is uh, robert.brook at virginiaipc.org, and we can coordinate a sort of a call, uh, email exchange. I ask some questions. We try to make sure that we give you the direction of, of, of understanding the program from an early stage, long range perspective. And I usually suggest companies really take it, think about this for a year to two years. If you're really early, look at it. Sometimes you're really sometimes too early. If you don't have a company established yet, you got to get that going. You got to get in some of the databases and really start planning what your uh, technical hurdle is. And then we have those discussions on how to approach the opportunities. And if it's not myself, um, perhaps you know, I, I refer companies to a lot of the outside uh, consultants as well. But if it's maybe a better fit with one of my colleague programs, I make those references as well. Great, Robert. Thank you so much for joining us and for the great information you've shared. And now I'd like to welcome two startup founders whose companies have successfully navigated the federal grant system to win some major grant awards that are helping to propel their early stage ventures. Our guests are Dr. Sammy Lemui, co-founder and CEO of Akamal Research Inc. and Dr. Sarah Snyder, co-founder and CEO of Beam Diagnostics. Sammy and Sarah, welcome. Hi Greg, thank you. Nice to be here, Greg. It's great to see you both. Uh, let's start, Sammy, with you. Why don't you give our audience a little background on Akamal, your mission, and the work that you're doing there? Sure. Um, thank you, Greg. Uh, so Akamal Research is a biotech startup company located in uh, Roanoke, Virginia. We started Akamal Research in 2016 as a spin-off company from the Friday Biomedical Research Institute at Virginia Tech Carillion. And at Akamal, we are developing uh, a novel cancer therapeutics to prevent um, tumor recurrence and metastasis uh, following conventional uh, treatments. So for this, we are developing a unique platform of therapeutics peptides, so small pieces of proteins that are more specific and less toxic to uh, really target cancer cells that are resistant to um, uh, conventional uh, treatments such as chemotherapy. So the first indication we are working on right now using these novel therapeutics is glioblastoma, the most deadly uh, and common type of brain tumor. And we are also developing these therapeutics for breast and colon cancers. Wow. Tell the audience uh, a little bit about the, the grant uh, that you have won and how that's helping uh, propel ACMA. So we were awarded uh, two phase one STTR from uh, the National Cancer Institute at NIH. Uh, the first one was awarded in 2017 for our glioblastoma indication, uh, for which we also received um, um, an STTR matching fund from the Virginia Center uh, for Innovative Technology, now Virginia Innovation Partnership. Uh, Corporation VIPC. And the second phase one STTR was awarded in uh, 2020 uh, uh, for our indication uh, on breast cancer. 
and and so one important component um, uh, for the grant process is making sure uh, that the company has all uh, the registrations uh, up to date, such as the system management award, for example, to being able to submit uh, this type of application. And, and I, I wanted to add that contacting um, uh, our program officer at uh, the SBR STTR program uh, was key to make sure that our specific aims align with the program. And of course, maintaining this relationship with the program officer is important, for example, um, uh, to go through reviewers' comments uh, on the proposal um, uh, uh, in order to being able to resubmit uh, a stronger application if needed. And, and what have you been able to do with that grant money to advance the work that you're doing there at Akamal? Yeah, so uh, the goal of uh, phase one SCTR is really to validate a proof of concept to, to determine if um, uh, the idea is feasible, uh, which thanks to these grants, in our case, we have already successfully achieved with our uh, new therapeutic peptide. So, so these federal fundings really allowed us to move um, uh, to the next stage of uh, our drug development. And, and one important aspect of the SCTR program in our case is that it required our company to um, uh, uh, collaborate with um, uh, non-profit um, um, research uh, organizations. So in our case, we were able uh, to closely work with uh, the Freien Biomedical Research Institute at VTC. And this is important because uh, often biotech startup company don't have wet lab uh, so, um, to, in order to conduct research and development. So having this strong collaboration with uh, the Research Institute here uh, was key to being able to get the data we needed uh, to achieve uh, phase one STTR. What's next on the horizon for uh, Akamal and the work that you're doing there, Sammy? So the next step for Akamal is to get uh, phase two STTR on our projects um, for glioblastoma and breast cancer. Um, I wanted to add that last year we uh, also closed a seed fund round with local investors, including uh, the Virginia Tech Carrion Ventures, uh, CIT, now VIPC, as well as local investors from the Commonwealth uh, Angel Group. So uh, we're going to keep pitching uh, uh, for additional funding um, uh, from investors. And altogether, this will um, allow us to uh, get new hires, as well as to get uh, the FDA approval to obtain the status of new investigational uh, drug for our therapeutic peptide in preparation for clinical trials. So you feel the uh, uh, grant program helped you unlock some uh, private money too in your case? Yes, definitely. Starting a, a new company um, uh, require funding and, and so uh, these type of funding are non-dilutive. So this is uh, uh, one of the best way to get, uh, to get started at the beginning. Yeah, thank you, Sammy. Sarah, let's turn to you and, and uh, tell our audience a little bit about Beam and the mission and work of your company, please. Yeah, absolutely. So Beam Diagnostics Inc. is a digital health company delivering innovative and data-driven assessments to improve patient-centered healthcare. The problem currently with the healthcare industry is that it's centered largely around reactive measures that can be costly to both the patient and to healthcare systems. So Beam's vision is to set the standard for administering measurement-based care through digital and interoperable technology to shift that standard of care from reactive to proactive. And to do this, we have developed Beacon, which is a digital assessment platform that equips providers with predictive technology about patient behavior to improve quality of care in both a time and cost-effective manner. And, and tell the audience a little bit about the types of grants that uh, Beam has been able to successfully win and how that's helped your company. Yeah, absolutely. So, so far we've obtained two phase one STTRs and one phase two STTR from the NIH. We've also been awarded three awards from the Center for Innovative Technology, now BIPC, uh, through their commercialization grant mechanism. And as far as our experience doing so, I think we've learned that even if you've had experience writing research grants in academia, that the SBIR and STTR grant mechanism really requires you to think 
strategically about areas outside of just the research science. Um, it requires you to think through the market opportunity, the commercialization of your product and customer adoption. So that um, at the end of your project, these grants really allow you to validate the science and make sure it works, but also on the end, understand how you're gonna market and sell to the appropriate customer and commercialize successfully. So you have been able to use the money to really, uh, as Robert Brook likes to say, to, to research, develop, and de-risk uh, the product to a point where you're at or near a point of commercialization? Yes, I would say that. That's true. Yeah, the, the federal grants, um, like Sammy mentioned, are a really great source of non-dilutive funding, and they've been instrumental in continuing to validate and help us develop our product and help us acquire the resources that we need to bring in the collaborators that we need through um, both the research and academic standpoint, but also our healthcare providers to launch and implement our project into the commercialization space. So what are the next big milestones on the horizon for beam diagnostic at this point, Sarah? Yeah, so we're currently implementing Beacon's lead assessment for alcohol misuse that accurately predicts alcohol risk among clinical patients in a regional healthcare system. Um, we're also working through developing our other assessments for predictive of behavioral um, health conditions and moving them through development and testing phases to add them to our Beacon platform. And very soon the Beacon platform will be available for use by large healthcare systems through our standalone web app and also integration into electronic medical health records. Fantastic. Sarah and Sammy, thank you so much for joining us today to share your stories of success. Uh, we wish you all the best uh, moving forward. And um, again, thank you for joining us today.